All right, so hey guys, Joe Marler with Daniel Defense, and we're going to cover a little bit of the history of the AR-15 and M-16 family of weapons. Back in the mid-50s, the U.S. Infantry was starting to look at a different service rifle to replace M1 Garands, M1 Carbines, M14s to be a standard service rifle across the board. So back during that time, Armalite decided they wanted to throw in a firearm and compete, and what they submitted was the AR-15. Uh, the lead designer for that was Eugene Stoner. It ultimately was selected to be the new service rifle for the infantry, and it first saw service during the Vietnam War. The very first introduction of the M16 was the M16A1. It had a 20-inch barrel, had a three-pronged flash hider on it, I had triangular hand guards. The front sight had a bayonet lug on the bottom so you could affix a bayonet. The rear sight was incorporated into a carry handle and it was adjustable for windage only. The front sight was adjustable for elevation, rear sight was only adjustable for windage. The fire control group was a full auto fire control group, so three settings, safe, semi, and full. And it had a fixed butt stock and a standard A1 style pistol grip. Fast forward a couple decades, the industry took what it had learned from the M16A1 and wanted to make some improvements to it. So we went from an M16A1 to an M16A2 in the mid 80s. Some of the things that they changed were, I'll start at the front, I'll kind of work my way back, the barrel. Okay, We went to a heavier profile barrel so that barrel wouldn't heat up as fast. We went to a different flash hider, what we consider an A2 birdcage flash hider. The front sight base didn't really change, it's still adjustable for elevation, you still have the bayonet lug. And over that barrel, we went to an A2 style handguard. So we got away from that triangular smooth handguard and went to something a little bit more oval shape that has some ribs around it, so a little bit more easy to hang on to. On the upper receiver, we switched from a, a rear sight that's only adjustable for windage, and we added adjustability for elevation as well. The butt stock got a little bit longer about 5 eighths of an inch longer. Some of the other stuff that was added to the upper receiver was a forward assist, so that if your bolt did not go into battery or if you did a press check and it didn't go back into battery, you could tap your forward assist to get that bolt to get fully engaged. And we also put a gate around the magazine release on the lower receiver so that it couldn't be accidentally depressed. One of the biggest things on the lower receiver was a change from a full auto fire control group to a three round burst fire control group. Back during the Vietnam era, lots of rounds were fired, not a lot of bad guys killed. So we essentially put a rev limiter on there to encourage folks to ensure they good sight picture and they're focused on putting rounds on target rather than just spraying and praying. So moving into the mid 90s, uh, this is where we come up with an M4A1. This is very similar to what an M4A1 looks like, okay? The biggest thing, starting from the front, going backwards, we shortened the barrel, okay? We went from a 20 inch barrel down to a 14 and a half inch barrel. When we did that, we also needed to shorten our gas system. We had to shorten the gas system so that we increased dwell time here to ensure that that rifle could operate with that shorter barrel length. The front sight base is still relatively the same, still only adjustable for elevation, still have a bayonet lug, so you still have that capability. Everything got shorter, so did the handguard. So this is basically an A2 style handguard, but it's for that carbine length gas system. You'll notice that we no longer have a fixed carry handle here. We have an M1913 Picatinny rail for mounting optics and sights. And on the back, we have an adjustable butt stock. So now we can adjust that stock depending on your body type. People of different stature have different lengths of arms. Some guys are gonna have on body armor, some guys aren't. So this just allowed the shooter to adjust that gun to, to fit their needs. Okay, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the history of the platform in general because it has a lot to do with the history of Daniel Defense. Back in the early 2000s, Marty had his own company. He was running a garage door and fireplace business and he was golfing on the weekends and he hated it. Every time he got done golfing, he just wasn't really relaxed at the end of the day and he decided he was gonna pick up a new hobby and that's when one of his friends introduced him into shooting. And he really, really liked shooting guns. And that's when he bought his first AR-15. He bought an old Colt SP-1. Now, for those of you not familiar with the Colt SP-1, uh, it looks a lot like an M16A1 has that fixed carry handle plastic handguards, but really no ability to mount modern red day optics that were coming about back during that time. So Marty was doing some research, he was looking at some manufacturers, he was trying to find a company that made a flat top upper receiver that would go on those old Colt SP-1 lowers. Now an old Colt SP-1 lower has a larger front pivot pin than what's currently produced today. And he couldn't find anybody to make one for him. 
So Marty hired an engineer to help design this product that he wanted to put on his Colt SP1 lower. And then he found a machine shop that was gonna help him make it. But when he was in the process of getting this done, the machine shop told him, hey, this is gonna cost you a lot of money and if you don't make at least 100 parts, then it's not gonna be worth your time, effort, or money. So Marty made the commitment to have a hundred of these big hole upper receivers made. And while they were being machined, he went ahead and set up a small website and started coming up with a really simple marketing plan to sell most of these uppers. He decided to keep a few for himself, but once he got those parts in his inventory, he launched the website, started marketing a little bit at some smaller trade shows like Knob Creek, Machine Gun Shoot, and he ended up selling those other 96 parts pretty fast. And he was like, wow, uh, this could be a pretty good business. So still working off of that Colt SP1 lower, he wanted to make something else. And he started making single point sling attachment that fit between a fixed butt stock and a lower receiver. We actually still have a photo of his original marketing campaign. It was a piece of eight by 11 college rule notebook paper with Sharpie that says, ask me about my sling loop. And that was our second part. And from there, it just kind of migrated into other things. And eventually, we got into making rail systems. In about 2004, 2005 timeframe is when Marty was approached by the SOCOM command. And they were telling him, hey, we're looking for a rail system. We know you guys make rail systems for the Army Marksmanship Unit. We would love if you guys would submit a product for the solicitation that's about to come out. Marty started working on that. And that's when we developed the RIS-2 handguard. And in 2006, we were awarded the IDIQ contract, which stands for Indefinite Delivery, Indefinite Quantity, and we've been supplying rail systems for the SOCOM community ever since. And from there, we just kept moving right along. In 2008, we were awarded the contract for the SA-80 rails, or the L-85 rails, for the UK Ministry of Defense. And in 2009 is when we introduced firearms. So we started our prototyping stage in 2008, and we introduced our first line of firearms in January of 2009 at SHOT Show down in Orlando. Our flagship model was the DDM-4 V1. And from there, our platform has just evolved into some of the nicest firearms you're gonna find today. Hey, this is our DDM-4 V7. This is in our Milspec Plus Brown Cerakote. This is a current production model where we have our own overmolded butt stock and pistol grip. We have full length hand guards. This is our MFR rail and M-Lock. We have our own muzzle devices now. We manufacture our own sights and we even manufacture our own carbon fiber reinforced polymer magazines. So this is just one evolution of the M4 carbine. The M16, M4s, they've been around for decades. They're gonna be around for decades longer. And I think Eugene Stoner is clapping in his grave to see that his platform that he designed back in the 50s is where it is today.